I'm Karin Lang, the Minister Counselor for Consular Affairs and Consul General here in Tokyo, Japan. I'd like to welcome you to this town hall for US citizens. Thank you for taking the time to join our Consular and Customs and Border Protections team to discuss immigrant and visitor visas for your family members. We hope this session is useful to you and we welcome your feedback. Please note that today we are not going to be covering passport, citizenship, and social security issues. If you have questions on those topics, please consult our website. You should be able to see the link to our embassy website in the Q&A box below now. So we will start today with a presentation from our Deputy Visa Chief, Greg Rankin. This presentation will cover family-based immigrant visas, travel on the visa waiver program, and visitor visas to the US. Once the presentation finishes, we'll take your questions. If you have a question, please click on the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Greg Rankin. Greg, are you there? I am here. Thank you so much, Karin. And thank you to all of you who have joined us. Wow, it looks like we have almost 200 people. It's great to have such a such a big audience. Um, so first, let's just talk about what we're going to talk about. Karin's already mentioned this, but I'll go through one more time. First, we're going to talk about immigrant petitions and the visas that result from them. We'll then talk about other immigration processes to the US. We'll talk about the visa waiver program and visitor visas for the US. And then we'll go through your questions. So feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box as we go along. Next slide, please. Uh, first, some definitions, because some of these terms will not be familiar with, to all of you, um, to many of you probably. Uh, and we'll start out with the term petitioner. The petitioner could well be you, the US citizen who wants to sponsor a family member to move to the United States. And petitioner we're talking about usually in an immigration context as opposed to a visitor context. The person who the petitioner sponsors is the beneficiary. And so that's the non-US citizen family member who will be immigrating to the US. And the form that the petitioner files is called a petition. And the most common one that we see here at the embassy in Tokyo and at our consulate general in Naha are, is the I-130. And the I-130 is what a US citizen can use to sponsor a spouse, a child, a parent uh, to immigrate to the United States. So petitioner files a petition to sponsor the beneficiary to immigrate to the United States. Once that petition is approved, the, the beneficiary can apply for a visa uh, or perhaps a tourist visa if they want to visit just for a short trip. Uh, and those visas will allow the traveler to go to the United States port of entry, usually the airport, and ask the Customs and Border Protection Officer for admission to the United States. Now, if you travel on a, an immigrant visa, then when you get to the United States, you become what we call a lawful permanent resident, and you get a green card. So you probably know the term green card. That's the informal term. We use it in the government as well for a permanent resident of the United States, a green card holder. And that's, there is a physical card that uh, is no longer green, used to be green back in the day. Uh, and that shows that you are authorized to reside, to work, to live in the United States. Now, after you've had a green card for some number of years, you can go through the process of naturalization. And that is the process where you become a US citizen. You have to be a green card holder first um, before you become a citizen. And those processes of naturalization and many of the other things that you'll do when you're in the United States, uh, trying to, to deal with the government with your status there, are handled by United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. That's a part of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and they're the ones who do green cards, they do I-130s and other petitions. Um, so they're an important agency for you to know if one of your family members is immigrating to the United States. And then finally, the National Visa Center. So if you're a family member is applying for a visa here in Tokyo, in Naha, somewhere else overseas. Uh, they'll probably deal with the National Visa Center and uh, NVC, as we call it, will help to collect the documents that they need to apply for the visa and just make sure that uh, they have all their documents in order before they come in for an interview. And hopefully that will make the interview process just a bit smoother for them when they do show up at the embassy or the consulate. The next slide, please. So to sum up, the path to US citizenship for a foreign uh, relative of a United States citizen 
first you get your immigrant visa, then you go to the US, you get your green card, and then you naturalize to become a US citizen. And on the next slide, we'll see how that's split between a couple of different agencies. Next, please. So overseas here in Japan and elsewhere, we have uh, embassies and consulates that are generally part of the Department of State. We have representatives of lots of agencies, but for this purpose, uh, I and Karin and our colleagues work for the Department of State. And we're the ones who will do your visa interviews uh, for immigrant visas or for non-immigrant or visitor visas as well. When you get to the US, you'll deal mostly with the Department of Homeland Security. They're the ones who will greet you at the airport, that's Customs and Border Protection. And then they'll also deal with your paperwork and uh, the naturalization process, for example, uh, and that's US Citizenship and Immigration Services. So those are both parts of uh, Homeland Security or DHS, and you'll deal with them mostly when you're in the United States. Next, please. So fear not, this is probably the most complicated uh, slide the whole, of the whole thing. Uh, just a summary of the immigrant visa process. And I'm not, now looking at the numbers one through five there on the left. So it starts with the petition. So you, the petitioner, would file uh, usually an I-130 petition for your non-US citizen relative, say your spouse. Uh, you file that petition, generally speaking, with USCIS in the United States. You do that by mail, uh, mail the petition into them, they will go to step number two, adjudicate that petition, approve it, perhaps ask you for more information about your relationship with the person, about your citizenship, uh, about their citizenship, what have you. And once they've approved that petition, on to step three, where the USCIS will forward the petition to the National Visa Center. And NVC will then look at that petition and say, okay, for this kind of petition, we need documents number one, two, three, four, and five. They'll ask the visa applicant, the beneficiary for those documents. And then they'll collect them and make sure that everything is, is available for when the petition moves to us at the embassy or the consulate overseas. And now we're on step four, where the beneficiary interviews at the embassy or the consulate. This is the immigrant visa interview. Um, and it's usually the first step where somebody has to do something in person. The rest of it is uh, either by mail or electronic online. And then number five, the consular officer, that, could be me or one of my colleagues, will approve or refuse the visa. Usually when we refuse an immigrant visa, that just means we're asking for more documents uh, or for different documents perhaps, and then we'll eventually usually be able to get to an issuance for your family member. Now there are some different steps for active duty military members. The most important thing is that in that case, the petitioner, if you're stationed here in Japan, uh, can file your petition with the embassy or consulate here in Japan. And so it moves that process from USCIS in the US to the embassy or consulate in Japan. It never goes to the National Visa Center. It's just a bit of expedited service that we can provide to our active duty military service members who are stationed overseas. Um, and then at the bottom, you'll see the normal processing times for those. And that's including all of those steps. So as you can see, it can be quite a lot faster if you're uh, active duty military or government stationed overseas. But the normal processing time um, is there on the left, and that's not, you know, different things will take different amounts of time, but so that you know what you need to prepare for if you're planning for your family member or relative to immigrate to the United States. Could we see the next one, please? So if you, I told you already that US government and military petitioners stationed overseas can file their petitions at the embassy or consulate. There are a few other sets of people who can do that. Um, and that's what we call petitioners with exceptional circumstances. Um, the most common one of these is when there's short notice of, uh, of the petitioner's relocation. So for example, you've been working here in Japan for 10 years and, uh, and your employer, not the US government, private company, is moving you back to the United States and you wanna bring your spouse with you, of course. So uh, that's a case where you can file that, you can ask us to file the petition here at the embassy or at our consulate general in Naha and, uh, and we can accept those petitions here in Japan. But uh, otherwise the petitions do need to be filed with uh, USCIS in the United States. That, that last bullet there is for circumstances like, for example, Ukraine, Afghanistan, uh, if when we had a big earthquake in Haiti a few months ago or a couple of years ago, we were able to accept those petitions overseas. But normally speaking, the process is to file that petition with USCIS in the United States. Next, please. So 
once you've filed your petition, what kind of visa can your relative apply for? So who can you file a petition on behalf of, in other words? Uh, the most common one that we see here in Japan is the spouse of a US citizen. Uh, that's what we call an IR1 or CR1 immigrant visa. Uh, if your spouse, if you have children, then your children are probably already US citizens. But if your spouse has children, so your stepchildren um, are unmarried and under 21 years old, then uh, we can take immigrant visa petition or applications for those people as well. Um, and then some people want to bring their parents to the US and that's what we call an IR5 parent of a US citizen. Now you've heard IR and CR a couple times. The difference there is how long the couple has been married. So if you've been married to your spouse for less than two years, then that spouse would go as a conditional resident, a CR. If they, you've been married for more than two years, then it would be, uh, they'd be a permanent resident, a full permanent resident when they arrive. And that's an IR visa. And then the same with the, uh, the children. So if you've been married to your spouse for less than two years, then their children would get CR2 visas. And that just adds an additional step once you're in the US to remove those conditions when you've been married for more than two years to that person. Next, please. So I've mentioned documents a couple of times. There are a lot of documents. There's no way around that. Sorry about it. Um, I'm not gonna read off all of these. I do wanna point out one in particular. At first, I wanna point out that a lot of these documents are things that you already have, right? These are documents as you read this list that you probably have or you easily know where to find them. Uh, one that you probably have, but that some people forget and we wanna remind you of is that if you've been married before and you're petitioning for your spouse, you will need to show evidence of termination of those prior marriages. And so that could be, usually it's a divorce decree or perhaps unfortunately your, your former spouse's death certificate. Uh, so make sure to bring those so that we can see that you were free to marry the person you're married to now and who you want to bring to, to the United States. When you do bring those to us, bring the original and a photocopy. We'll keep the copy, you'll keep the original. Uh, and so that's at the I-130 filing stage. That goes to either us if you're filing here or USCIS if you're filing uh, the normal way by May. Uh, next, please. So when you get to the visa interview, there's a slightly different set of, of papers that we'll ask for. Uh, again, some of these are things that you have, but more often in this case, these are ones you don't. So you'll need a medical exam. We have uh, a number of panel physicians uh, who you can get your medical exam from, a couple in Tokyo, one in Osaka, one in Okinawa. Uh, we'll need police certificates for a certain number of countries, depending on your nationality, the applicant's nationality, and where the applicant has lived as an adult. We'll need financial documentation to show that that person has enough money to support themselves uh, in the United States. And then there may be other documents uh, depending on the applicant. Next, please. I mentioned police certificates and that's one that's uh, sometimes a little bit tricky to get. So I wanna point you to where you can find instructions for how to get those documents. If you start at travel.state.gov, always a good idea if you're reading about, uh, or if you're interested in learning more about US visas is to go to travel.state.gov. But here in particular, if you go there, go to the US visas tab, and then you'll see a tab for reciprocity and civil documents by country. And that means that it'll tell you about the police certificates and, and other documents issued by different countries, depending on where you've lived, where you're, what nationality you are. And that will have some information about how you can get, for example, a police certificate from Myanmar, or maybe you can't get it. It'll tell you that as well if it's not obtainable. So that's where to look for information about uh, obtaining police certificates. Next, please. It's not a super fast process, so you want to avoid delays where you can. Uh, make sure that you start the process as early as you reasonably can, uh, collecting those original documents to go with your I-130 petition. Be aware that visa applications could require administrative processing, and that's a process that we really can't say how long it's going to take. It doesn't happen to most people, but it does occasionally, and it can add time to the issuance process for an immigrant visa. And then this last point, you must file a separate petition for each beneficiary. So for example, if you're filing for a spouse and a stepchild, that's two different I-130 petitions. You file for one and then you file for the other and they're, they're separate. They can be linked to each other, but they're separate uh, petitions. So be aware of that. And then at the visa interview stage, uh, be aware that getting those police certificates, depending on where they're from, can take some time. So make sure you, you plan for that. 
and medical clearances from when you get the appointment until you get the report back can take up to a month. It can be less, it can be a little more, um, but they do take some time to, to get in there and get that report. And don't forget to make an appointment. We can't see you unless you have an appointment to come see us. Next, please. When you go to the US, uh, make sure that you have a visa that is still valid. Immigrant visas are usually valid for up to six months and they expire on the day that the medical exam expires. So the medical exams clear you for six months to immigrate to the US and then the visa will expire right after that. Uh, there is one more fee. Well, there's not one more fee. There is another fee when you immigrate to the United States, and that's the USCIS uh, immigration fee to obtain your actual green card. You'll pay that when you go to the US. And make sure you bring in your carry-on bag with you, your visa itself in your passport. And in some cases, we'll give you the immigrant, we'll give the immigrant a sealed envelope with original documents. If you get one of those, uh, don't open it. That's for Customs and Border Protection at the US Port of Entry. Um, not everyone gets one, but if you get one, bring it with you and keep it closed. Next, please. After you arrive, you'll get your green card from USCIS. It takes a few months to receive the physical card. Um, likewise, your social security card uh, will come within a few weeks of arrival. And those do have to go to a US address, which of course makes sense because you've just immigrated to the United States. Next, please. We get a lot of questions about maintaining lawful permanent resident status or green card holder status uh, for people who live here in Japan. So I wanna point out that I think people are familiar with the 12 month period where if you're outside the United States for more than 12 months, you could lose your, uh, your green card status. There are exceptions for military and government dependents. If you're a service member stationed here in Japan, your spouse and children uh, can be outside the US for more than 12 months, even if they are green card holders, that's okay as long as they're on orders. Uh, but if you're a contractor or any other private citizen, then you're not accepted from that. You do, your, your spouse and children who are permanent residents do need to be in the US um, at least every year. And that's because the point of a green card is that it means you're a lawful permanent resident. We expect you to live in the United States with that, uh, with that green card. Um, and there are ways, the re-entry permit is something that you can get. It's a little book that looks like a passport, but it's not. Um, and that can extend your stay abroad from one year to two. You do have to file that before you leave the United States. So let's say that you know you're going to Japan for a two year assignment with your employer. Uh, your spouse won't be able to go back. Uh, your, your green card holder spouse can file for a re-entry permit before you leave the United States uh, that will allow that extended stay, but those can only go up to two years and you do have to apply for it before you leave the United States. Um, otherwise, we do find people lose their status uh, as green card holders, um, which is unfortunate for them, but of course, the expectation is that you're living in the US with that, with that green card. So that's how our system's set up right now. The next slide, please. Uh, we'll talk about what happens if you do lose that status and you want to move back to the United States. It's what we call a returning resident or SB1 visa. And it lets people regain their lawful permanent resident status without a new petition. So to get that, you have to show that when you left the United States, you were a lawful permanent resident. When you left, you intended to return to the United States and you continued to intend to return to the United States and that the reasons for your stay outside the United States were beyond your control. You, you couldn't help that you stayed outside the US for more than a year. Now we have a lot of these right now and we have for the last year or so because people have been here in Japan, they've not visited the US in a while because of COVID um, and, and we understand that and we're willing to work with people uh, on that when that's the reason for their protracted stay outside of the United States. Now, if you've been outside the US since 2017, for example, that'll be a bit harder case to make, right? Because COVID of course wasn't happening in 2018 or 19. Um, in order to get that SB1 visa, you will have to do two in-person appointments, one to file a form DS-117, and that's where we assess you on those three points above. Uh, and then the next one, when you apply for the actual SB1 visa, and then you'll need a medical exam and some other paperwork that we'll tell you about at that time. So plan for a couple of months uh, to get an SB1 visa if that's what you need to get back to the US. 
Next, please. So one thing we haven't talked about yet are fiance visas. We've talked about I-130s and immigrant visas and fiance or K-1 visas are a little bit different from that. They're technically speaking, not immigrant visas. They are non-immigrant visas. And so they have a different form that you send to USCIS uh, to petition for your non-US citizen fiance. And then once that uh, form is approved, we got some questions about timeline. It's about a year or so for USCIS to approve that petition. And then a couple months to collect documentation. And then another few weeks to get your appointment and get your immigrant visa uh, taken care of here at the embassy. So plan on something like 12 to 18 months for a fiance visa. Uh, and when your fiance gets to the US, you do need to get married within 90 days. And then you'll have to change status to a CR1 immigrant status when you get there. That's with USCIS. So if you have a choice, it can be faster for you to get married here in Japan and immigrate as the spouse instead of fiance of a US citizen. Um, but we do take fiancés, we see them all the time, and we're happy to, uh, to work with those folks. Next, please. <clears throat> okay, visa waiver program. So we've talked before about things where people are intending to go to the US and stay there. So now let's talk about ways that you can go to the US and not stay there. You wanna visit for a few months, you wanna stay for a couple of weeks of vacation or a couple of months to visit family and relatives, and then come back to Japan or, or wherever you happen to be going. <clears throat> If you're Japanese, you can use the visa waiver program, uh, or if you're one of 38, 37 other nationalities, that visit has to be for, th for 90 days or less uh, for tourism or business. And you do need to have a valid ESTA authorization. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you'd have to hold an e-passport, which is usually not a problem for Japanese people. The little logo, the chip logo on the cover shows that it's an e-passport. Most Japanese have that. And if you have prior travel to certain other countries or a second nationality of certain other countries, then you can't use the visa waiver program. Uh, instead, you can get a visa. Next, please. Uh, here's the website for how to apply for ESTA and uh, USCIS's recommendation that you make that application at least a few days in advance. Next, please. Uh, it'll take some basic biographic information. It's all in English. Uh, Travelers of any age, from babies onwards, need their own ESTA applications. And someone can do it on your behalf if you have a travel agent or a company uh, immigration person, for example, they can do ESTA on your behalf. Go ahead. ESTA is valid for two years, uh, generally speaking, uh, for as many times as you want to go or until your passport expires, whichever comes first. Uh, ESTA is electronic. So there's no printed copy to carry, uh, just bring your passport. <clears throat> and you do have to update your ESTA if you get a new passport, change your name, or, or some of those other things change. Go ahead. If your ESTA is denied, that doesn't mean you can never go to the United States. It just means that you can't use the visa waiver program. So instead, come to us at the embassy or one of our consulates and apply for a visitor visa, uh, a B visa, uh, as a tourist to the US. Next, please. ESTA is, and the Visa Waiver Program are run by the Department of Homeland Security, specifically Customs and Border Protection. And so the embassies and consulates have limited access to ESTA information or ESTA data. But here's the URL that you can go to to ask questions about the Visa Waiver Program and ESTA. Go ahead. So for a B visa or the Visa Waiver Program, you can do basically the same things once you get to the US. You can go for tourism, medical treatment, um, visiting family or friends, and all kinds of different business purposes like attending conferences or trade shows, uh, meetings, negotiating contracts, speaking as long as you're not paid for it. The one thing you really can't do in the US on a visitor visa or on the visa waiver program is work. You can't work. Uh, and you can't be a full-time student either. If we go next. Uh, full-time students not allowed on uh, visitor visas or the visa waiver program. 
uh, we do have student visas that we give out here at the at the embassy. So please apply for a student visa, go study in the States, but it's a different kind of visa. Likewise, for any of those different kinds of work that are shown that are shown there, uh, those require different kinds of visas that are all available, but you'll have to uh, to apply for it separately. Next, please. Now, if you need to apply for a visa, uh, the first thing to do is make sure that you have a passport that's valid. Next, you can fill out our application form. It's called DS-160. Um, and that, along with it, requires a photograph. It has to be passport size, and it needs to be a white background. I know Japan likes blue backgrounds. We use white backgrounds. Um, so make sure you bring us a white background photo. Uh, and when you do that, take off your glasses uh, for your photo. And we like your smiles, but not in your passport or in your visa photos. So please give a, us a neutral facial expression when you submit that photo. Um, then you can pay your $160 visa application fee and schedule your interview. Once your interview is finished, if you're approved, then you'll get your visa uh, by mail, or if you choose to pick it up, that's fine too. Usually it takes a week or so for you to get your visa returned after the interview in most cases. But apply early because uh, you never know what can happen, what other documents or extra processing might be needed. So please apply as early as you can, especially now that we, as we're going into our uh, busy summer season at the embassy and our consulates. Next, please. We do have lots of ways for you to get in touch with us. We have a couple of different websites. You see the one for us at the embassy and also uh, for CBP if you're interested in the visa waiver program. We have an email address and we have a couple of different Twitter accounts if you're interested in visas or citizen services. Uh, those are different ways that you can get in touch with us. We hope you will. Uh, we hope you'll ask questions and we're more than happy to answer whatever questions uh, you might have. Thanks so much. Thank you, Greg, for that very helpful overview of immigrant and visitor visas. Um, well, we covered a lot of ground um, in that presentation, and now we will start the Q&A. I know we have a lot of questions in the chat box already. I, I do just want to note that we also have Customs and Border Protection attache Cletus Hunt joining us today to answer questions that relate to DHS. Um, so if you have a question and you've not already done so, please click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And we will do our best to answer your question either live here, um, audio or in the chat function. Our moderator will be reading some of as many questions as we can um, aloud so we can answer them live. So let's take our first question. Moderator? The first question is, I have an approved immigrant visa petition, but don't plan to use it anytime soon. Can I travel through the visa waiver program or on a B1, B2 visa? This question could be answered by our Customs and Border Protection colleague, Cletus. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I hope you can hear me. I'm dialing in from a remote location today and unable to be there in the embassy with my colleagues. Uh, the answer to that question is yes, you can certainly travel to the United States as a visitor with either a visitor visa or on the visa waiver program. Uh, the only caveat I would, I would offer is that please ensure that you are in fact in visitor status when you seek entry to the United States. Um, applying for entry and then making the statement that, oh, we're coming to set up our home for living here permanently in a, set, in, a, in a few months may cause the officer to believe that you're an intending immigrant and not entitled to enter the United States as a temporary visitor for pleasure. So the answer, the short answer is yes, you certainly can, uh, but just ensure that you are in fact visiting the United States uh, for business or for pleasure. Thank you, Cletus. Um, next question. The next question is about vaccinations and COVID. Can unvaccinated Japanese spouses of US citizens enter the US on a visitor visa? If they have a negative PCR test and quarantine, is that okay? Thanks for asking that question. And I know that there are a lot of COVID related uh, questions in the chat box. So the first thing I'm gonna advise is that for every individual situation that you check the embassy website 
or you go online and check the CDC website, the centers, U.S. Centers for Disease Control. The basic answer is if you are not a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident, you will need to be vaccinated. You will you will need to have the approved course of vaccination with an approved vaccine plus a negative test, which can be an antigen test or a PCR test in order to board a flight to the United States. Um, and so there are very few exceptions to that. Um, again, those are, those are regulations controlled by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. Um, and I would encourage you to very, very carefully review their website. Um, but yes, the short answer is yes, you will need to be vaccinated and have a negative COVID test or proof of recovery from COVID within the last 90 days. Vaccination plus proof of recovery. Um, so I'm going to leave it there and just, just really encourage people to check your individual circumstances with the CDC website. Thanks. Next question. I'm a U.S. citizen and my wife is Japanese. Is there a way she can apply for a green card without being vaccinated from COVID? This is over to Greg. Yeah, so this is similar to what Karin already said. Um, <clears throat> to get a, an immigrant visa right now, part of the medical exam process covers lots of different vaccinations. And as of a few months ago, one of those vaccinations that you need to get your medical clearance and therefore your immigrant visa is for COVID. And so, yes, we will uh, look for all our immigrant visa applicants to have a COVID vaccine completed. Um, there are, again, very few exceptions to that. For example, if you're allergic to the components of the shot, something to that effect. But uh, personal choice, unfortunately, or fortunately, regardless, is not one of those uh, ways that you can be accepted from needing to have the vaccination to immigrate to the US. This next question is for Customs and Border Protection. I'd like to know the difference in current and future processing times for the different categories of visas. So these are the categories I'm asking about. Green card application, immigrant spouse visas, non-immigrant spouse visas, K-3s, also known as, and non-immigrant fiancé visas, known as K-1s. Over to you, Cletus. Thank you. Uh, so the easiest way to find out what the, the average processing time is for a specific application is to go to the USCIS.gov website. And on that website, you will see a link that actually says check case processing times. So you click on that link and you're able to select any application that you could file with USCIS and the service center in which you will be filing that application. Some applications can only be filed at one service center, so it's an easy selection, but uh, you can select the application, the service center where you intend to file, and it will give you the average processing time. So usually there'll be a low end and a high end, uh, and that'll give you sort of an estimate of how long you should uh, anticipate waiting. Thanks, Cletus. Uh, next question. My wife was issued a permanent resident visa, a green card, but then she gave up her green card a couple of years ago. If in the future she decides to apply again for a green card, is the application process the same, or does the fact that she previously had a green card make the process any faster? Greg? Uh, so the simple answer is yes, it is generally the same process. Um, whether it's your first green card or your second, uh, the process still goes petition, visa, and then you immigrate and get the green card. Um, yeah, so not really any difference there. Thanks, Greg. Next question. My wife and I do not intend to move back to the United States since I'll retire outside of the U.S., so we don't want to obtain a green card. But if we should ever choose to travel for leisure to the United States, will my wife be able to apply for and receive a tourist visa to travel with me? Greg? Yep, so first, a good choice not to get a green card if you don't intend to permanently reside in the United States. Uh, tourist visas are just fine for people who are visiting. If that's, uh, you know, a couple months in the summer, a uh, few weeks in the around the holidays in the winter, 
that's just right for using either the visa waiver program, as long as it's less than 90 days, uh, or a tourist visa. So yes, please do uh, travel on one of those means, depending on your spouse's nationality. Uh, if they're Japanese, then the visa waiver program is would be appropriate. Uh, getting a, a regular visa would also be just fine. And if your spouse is not Japanese, that may be the way you have to go. Um, but yes, the, to sum up, please do use those uh, either visas or the visa waiver program for your travel if you're not planning to live in the United States. Those are much more appropriate in that case than getting a green card. Thanks, Greg. How early can I start the immigration process for my Japanese wife? I'm a military member in Okinawa, and I leave in September 2023. Greg? So for military members with that timeline, there's no need to start right now, but you certainly may start right now if you want. Uh, you can get in touch with our consulate in Naha uh, about filing your petition with them. And then whenever you're ready for your spouse to actually apply for her visa, uh, I think I said her, then she can go into the consulate and, and take care of that process. Now, keep in mind that the immigrant visa will only be valid for at most six months. Um, so you don't want to go too early and have that visa uh, expire because then you'll have to pay another fee. You'll have to pay for another medical exam. There's, there's, there's no advantage to getting one that you're not going to use. But the petition does not expire. So if you want to file the petition sooner than you are, you are welcome to at your, at your convenience. Just get in touch with our consulate in Naha and they'll help you schedule an appointment. Same if you were up here in Tokyo, get in touch with us and we would help you schedule an appointment. The timelines are similar. Thanks, Greg. And that brings up a, a point that I just wanna emphasize, which is that we process immigrant visas in two places in Japan, in Tokyo and in Naha. So if you live in another part of Japan, in Osaka or Fukuoka or Sapporo, we also have consulates there, but they do not get involved in immigration. So you will have to go to either Naha or Tokyo. And all that information is on our website. Thanks. Let's go to the next question. I'm an American citizen. My wife is a Japanese citizen who's never lived in the United States. What happens if my wife and I visit the United States with the intention of staying three months or less, but then we want to extend the stay? Can we fly or drive to Canada or Mexico and return for another three months? Also, once I retire, if we want to live part-time in the U.S. and part-time in Japan, what is the best strategy? Cletus? Thank you. So this is a bit of a complicated question and I'll do my best to, to answer it. So those for, for those travelers that enter the United States under the visa waiver program, which is what I'm assuming you're referring to when you say a period of 90 days or less, there is no opportunity to extend that stay. And short departures to either Canada or Mexico do not qualify as, uh, as a meaningful departure from the United States and would not grant you authorization for an additional 90 day period. So my recommendation is if you intend to be in the United States for a period that exceeds you 90 days as a visitor for business or pleasure, that you obtain a visitor visa for that purpose. With the visitor visa, you would be allowed to enter the United States for an initial period of six months uh, with an opportunity to extend that uh, stay for an additional six months for up to one year. <clears throat> and then the second part of that question about whether if you want to reside in the United States uh, part-time and outside of the United States part-time with a non-US citizen spouse, I would offer that that would be much more difficult to do. Um, because if you are speaking about out living in the U.S., which is what the question refers to, then the only way to do that as a non-U.S. citizen is to either have uh, a lawful permanent resident card or to become a U.S. citizen. And so you may find it challenging to uh, find entry to the U.S. as a visitor for a six-month period if, in fact, you are living in the U.S. for six months and then living somewhere else for an additional six months. Did I, did I cover all the bases of that question? Yes, I think so, Cletus. I, so in general terms, then what, what I take from that is if you really are planning to live in both places, then that is when a green card, uh, legal permanent resident status 
probably would make more sense than traveling back and forth on either visa waiver program or a temporary visitor visa. That is correct. Thanks, Cletus. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Is an immigrant permitted to leave and re-enter the U.S. while awaiting receipt of their green card? Cletus? Yes, you are. Uh, typically, when you enter the United States with your immigrant visa packet, you will receive an endorsement in your passport that authorizes, that's typically, it serves as a, a temporary green card for a period of one year. And you're able to utilize that to uh, exit and re-enter the United States until such time that you receive your official document. Great, this next one is for Greg. We have an I-130 petition approved. Is there anything we can do to not attend the final interview or to have the interview waived? So the short answer is no. There's the U.S. law does require interviews in person for every immigrant visa applicant. Okay, back to Cletus. I'm a U.S. citizen in Japan on SOFA status. My wife is a Japanese citizen who holds a valid green card. We have not been able to return to the U.S. due to COVID and her re-entry permit expired in December, 2022. Her green card- 2021. Oh, must have meant 2021. Her green card will expire in 2023. We want to go back to the US for a visit this year and then renew her green card next year. My assignment in Japan doesn't end until 2025. Should we try and renew her green card next year from Japan? or do we wait until we move back to the US? So unfortunately I lost, I lost the connection there for a short period of time. Can you still hear me? We can hear you Cletus. It's kind of a complicated question. And I, I do wanna just encourage people, you know, very, very specific questions are, are really hard to answer in a forum like this. We're trying to give more general information um, I think what I take from this question is we are residing in Japan and we are not leaving until 2025. So should we apply for the green card now? I think the answer to that. Well, is I, I thought I heard something about SOFA status though. And so, you know, we would certainly need to I think explore this in a little more detail. Certain SOFA status, uh, certain individuals with SOFA status, I think as Greg mentioned during his presentation, if they're here on orders uh, and they're a direct hire, particularly usually of the military, their green card holding uh, spouse would be exempt the traditional residency requirements and would be able to return to the US with an expired document. But, but as, uh, as Karen mentioned, we would really need to look at that on an individual basis. Uh, and probably not best to answer in this form without all of those details. Great, thanks Cletus. That is a really good point for SOFA status members. And again, um, as we have shown on the screen a few times, um, please contact us individually with questions like this so we can make sure we're giving you the right advice for your specific situation. Next question. Greg, this question is for you. With no travel planned and no intent to retire in the US, will a foreign national spouse encounter any difficulty obtaining a tourist visa should we ever decide to visit the US? Well, so it's hard to make broad statements and we can't make guarantees when it comes to this stuff because every case is individual. Um, but generally speaking, as long as the visa officer doing the tourist visa interview and the CBP officer at the airport in the US agree that there's no evidence of intent to stay in the United States or work in the United States, then that person, generally speaking, shouldn't have any trouble visiting the US for, for short trips, regardless of what nationality they are, if they're not American. Great, thank you. Is there anyone who can review my application for accuracy before I pay the fee and submit it? 
Well, it's not a service that we provide at the embassy or the consulates. When we review your application, it's after you've paid the fee and we're providing the service of, of making that yes or no decision on your application. If you want somebody to look at it beforehand, you may want to consider a travel agent or an immigration attorney. But in most cases, um, we find that that's, that's not necessary. Most people don't, don't need that. Um, but it's up to you if you want to avail of one of those services. It's not one that we provide uh, as the U.S. government, though. Thanks, Greg. Is there an expedited process for military personnel and their family members? So I, I mentioned earlier that we do accept uh, petitions, I-130 petitions from service members uh, on behalf of their foreign citizen relatives. Um, and that does expedite the immigration process substantially. Uh, so that, that's one, that's the main answer to that question. The other is that if you find yourself with a short amount of time before your transfer back to the US, um, we can generally speaking, get immigrant visas completed for uh, spouses and children of service members within just a few months, uh, if need be. Um, if you if you get right down to the to the last minute, so we can help with expediting. Oh, and my colleagues are putting the website uh, up there right now, which is great. Um, we can both accept the petitions here, either in Tokyo or in Naha, and then we can make sure that we get your family member in for their immigrant visa interview as quickly as possible, if necessary, to make your to make your transfer date. And please do look at our website for more information about that. Thanks, Greg. So the next question is, do any of the processing times for immigrant visas depend on the spouse's citizenship or country of residence? Cletus, do you want to start that one? <laughs> Well, actually, I don't know that I have a good answer for that one. I, you know, I would offer that the answer is probably no, but I mean, that would best be answered by a representative from USCIS, unless you have better information. No, I don't. I mean, the primary thing that they're looking at at that petition stage is the relationship between the American citizen and the foreign national beneficiary. But yeah, that's, that process is one that neither Cletus nor Karin nor I are directly involved in. So one thing I would add to that, I agree with you, but if, if the question is not about the USCIS approval, but the process of actually scheduling an immigrant visa interview overseas, then of course it would depend on the availability of immigrant visa appointments in whatever country the spouse is residing in. Here in Japan, um, we do not have a backlog of immigrant visa appointments. Um, we are pretty current with scheduling them, so there should not be anything more than the normal um, process of scheduling, which we do on a monthly basis. But again, it's very hard to say, depending on what country the person lives in, um, and I would direct you to the embassy, the U.S. embassy in that country if it's not in Japan. Hope that helps. Next question. I'm wondering about entering the US and the requirements for a <clears throat> PCR test. Do people have to be vaccinated or have a PCR test to enter the US? Okay, so this is the, a version of the question that we talked about earlier in the chat. Um, I do wanna clarify that the US does not have a PCR test requirement. It could be an antigen test. Um, again, please consult either our embassy website, um, COVID information and travel information, or you could consult the um, US CDC website directly, and maybe we can share that in the uh, chat so people have that um, to make sure that you are prepared before you go to the airport. Thanks. Can you clarify when family members who want to visit Japan can come? Will we be allowed to invite family members from the US to come visit us? Yeah, so I know that there are a lot of concerns about this and that this is you know, really something that American citizens in Japan have, have really struggled with throughout the pandemic. 
Um, it really is not the topic of our conversation today. And the short answer is, of course, it's really up to the Japanese government what its border and entry restrictions are. So um, please continue to check our website, follow us on social media. We try very hard to share the latest Japanese government guidance on travel restrictions. I think everybody is aware that slowly Japan is opening up to more categories of travelers. Um, at this time, certain categories of business travelers and students are able to enter. Um, and there has been some talk of slowly opening to more categories of visitors. Um, but again, this is not in our control. This is up to the Japanese government. And we will do our best to provide you um, with updated information as it becomes available. Thanks. Here's a question for Greg. Is there something special I must do if I'm a dual citizen? For example, if I want to get a tourist visa? Uh, not necessarily. When you apply for that visa, you'll present one passport or the other, um, but please include in your application where it asks if you have any other nationalities, please do list that other nationality. Um, if you're a dual citizen, that means you have two chances to qualify for the visa waiver program. If you one of those citizenships is one that's one of those 38 member countries. Uh, and in that case, of course, you could use the visa waiver program unless you're one of those few uh, countries that doesn't where dual, citizen, dual citizenship rules you out. Um, but for most dual citizens, no, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily change um, the process. You would pick one passport or the other and apply using that one. Oh, can I just add to that? Um, unless one of your citizenships is a U.S. passport, because if, if you're a dual citizen and one of those citizenships is the U.S. citizenship, then please do not apply for a visa. In that case, you should always enter and exit the U.S. on your U.S. passport. In fact, we don't want you entering the U.S. on a different passport. Um, and if you apply for a visa and you are a U.S. dual citizen, it will be a waste of your money because we will not give you a visa uh, if you're a U.S. citizen. Thanks. Another question for Greg. For the military blanket exception, if the beneficiary is not fluent in English, can she bring her translator to the interview? Uh, so the short answer is yes. If you're not fluent in either English or Japanese, because we're in Japan, uh, then you may bring a translator. We usually don't allow extra people in our uh, waiting room along with the applicants, but there are exceptions. If you are uh, particularly you know, old or young and you need someone to assist you, if you, ha are, you know, have a, someone who assists you to physically move around, then we'll let you bring an assistant with you, of course. Um, and also, if you don't speak either English or Japanese, uh, then you're welcome to bring an interpreter with you who, but, but please make sure that person does speak either English or Japanese. Either one of those is, languages is fine. Thanks, Greg. Greg, is there a specific visa for a Japanese spouse of an American citizen if they both live in Japan and will not move to the United States? Yeah, that would be the tourist visa or the visa waiver program. Either one of those would be fine, depending on how long your stay in the U.S. is. If you plan to visit for tourism or business for a short stay, then by all means, uh, file that ESTA application and travel on the visa waiver program or get yourself a B visa and you can travel on that visa. Greg, this one's for you too. If we have to PCS as a military family before the final interview, how would my spouse re-enter Japan to finish the process if we can't wait for that final interview? This is pertaining specifically to an IR1 visa, a spouse visa. Yeah, well, I would first suggest do, doing your best to work with us. We will work with you or our consulate in Naha will work with you um, to do our best to make that final visa issuance happen before your PCS date. Um, you know, nobody wants anyone to have to travel back to Japan just to get a visa. Um, if your spouse is not Japanese, uh, then, and you don't think that you'll have enough time for that spouse to wait in Japan to get the visa, then 
um, it is always possible to move that application to their country of nationality. If your spouse happens to be Filipino, for example, you could move it to Manila or, or what have you. Um, but we will work with you uh, to do our best to get you in and out before that PCS date. But please do uh, send us that request to either file your petition or get your visa appointment, a visa interview appointment completed as early as possible. The next question is about- one, one, one second, this is uh, Cletus. I just wanted to jump in. <clears throat> if I'm hearing the question correctly, I think they're talking about trying to take a spouse to the United States that's pending an immigrant visa while they're PCSing to the US. Uh, I would offer that that's, I don't wanna say it's impossible, but the spouse that is PCSing with the US citizen will not have the appropriate documents with which to enter the United States because the purpose of that visit is not to visit for a short period for business or pleasure, um, and they would require the immigrant visa. So uh, again, as, as Greg mentioned, I think it would be most advantageous to obtain that immigrant visa prior to PCSing, or the spouse will not have the required documents with which to enter the US. Thanks, Cletus, for that perspective. That is really important for people to plan ahead as much as you possibly can. Next question. Is there a time limit for the returning resident SB1 application? My wife, a green card holder prior to leaving the United States, and I have been in Japan for three years. Well, there's no, there's no statute of limitations on that application. But at any time when you're applying for that SB1 visa, you will need to show that the prolonged stay, that is the, the stay more than one year outside the United States, was for reasons beyond your control, beyond the control of the, the, the non-US non citizen. And the longer you stay overseas, the more difficult that can become. Um, so what's the... Let me give you a couple of examples. One is a case that is often a, a credible reason that that stay has been extended uh, beyond a year. Uh, and that's if someone comes to Japan, for example, to take care of an aging relative. If your parent is ill and you are that parent's primary caregiver uh, and you fill that role for a number of years, we generally will look at that um, we try to look at that favorably. Um, that, that to us is a credible reason that your stay in Japan can be more than a year or stay outside the United States can be more than a year. Um, on the other hand, if, you're, if you come to Japan to take up employment with a Japanese company and you keep that job for three years, what, whatever amount of time it is, then that's one where uh, that prolonged stay abroad was within your control. You chose to come here and take up employment. Um, you could have chosen to stay in the United States uh, and keep your employment. So uh, that's, the, that's the longer answer to that question. The shorter answer is there is no legal statute of limitations. The longer answer is take a look at those three points. You see our web pages on the screen and consider whether that prolonged stay was for reasons beyond your control. Thanks, Greg. Next question. My wife and daughter both have green cards, but neither was able to travel back to the US due to COVID. How do we go about making sure their green cards are still valid? We are trying to return to the US soon. So this is related to the question I think that Greg just answered. Um, it's hard to answer that question without knowing how long they have been outside the US, but if it has been more than one year, Greg? If it's been more you... than one year, then they will probably need to apply for a returning resident visa. Um, and so our, our website does have information about how you can file that application. Um, if it's been less than a year, then if they, they should be okay to travel on the green cards they have. Um, but again, you'll want to 
consider was, you know, what was the reason that was beyond their control that they stayed outside the United States? And just as an additional comment, um, and, and not in, in particular response to this question, um, but for those that um, are in similar circumstances, the lawful permanent residents have been able to return to the United States during COVID uh, for, for the entire time. And so I, you know, I know that folks have chosen not to travel for various reasons and, and certainly valid uh, reasons. However, the, the COVID did not restrict um, lawful permanent residents from returning to the United States to maintain their residency status. Uh, so just for, for those that may be in similar circumstances that are you know, considering whether or not you should or should not return before the year period is up, um, please keep that in mind. Thanks, Cletus. I think that's a really good point. Next question. My wife was denied for ESTA and we are only going to visit the United States for a short visit. Can she apply for a tourist visa? Does she need an interview? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, she may apply for a tourist visa. It sounds like she will need to if she wants to visit the U.S. And she will need an interview for that visa. Now, that interview can be here in Tokyo, but it can also be at any of our, one of our consulates here in Japan, either in Naha, as we, we do immigrant visa services in Tokyo and Naha. For non-immigrant visa services, like tourist visas, uh, we also offer appointments in Osaka, Sapporo, and Fukuoka. So any of those uh, five locations are options to apply for a tourist visa. But yes, if your ESTA application was denied and you need a visa, then you will need to interview at a U.S. embassy or consulate. Thanks, Greg. Next question. This question is about abandoning a green card. My wife, a Japanese national, had a valid U.S. green card when we left the U.S. in 2011. We were not sure whether we would be returning to the U.S., so she didn't get a reentry permit. The few times she's accompanied me back to the U.S., she has been pulled out and questioned by U.S. immigration. This gives her great anxiety, and so she's hoping she could abandon her green card before visiting the U.S. again. However, the last time we looked up how to do this, it required traveling to uh, another consulate to file the paperwork. Is there any other way to do this to avoid a costly and time-consuming trip? Greg, you wanna take that one? Um, so we used to at U.S. embassies and consulates accept forms for people who are abandoning their green cards. We do not accept that, generally speaking, anymore. Um, it is a USCIS function, and in fact, we have on our website, which my colleagues are showing here, um, how to file that paperwork. Uh, it does not require you to come to an embassy or consulate in person. Uh, you can send it by mail, and once you've done that, um, you can then, or your spouse can then apply for a tourist visa or potentially the visa waiver program. In this case, a tourist visa might be the easier way to go um, because that person has previously had a, a green card, but certainly they could try, they could try either way. Great. Thank you. This could be a question for Cletus or Greg. Can I travel to the United States for pleasure while my immigrant visa is being processed? Yeah, I think we had a version of this question earlier. Uh, <clears throat> the answer to that is yes, if in fact you meet the definition of a visitor for pleasure. So again, keep in mind that if you're simply going for a short visit that is truly for uh, temporary business or pleasure, and you certainly could enter the U.S. as such. Um, but if you are going to the U.S. Um, and intent to reside there until such time that your visa becomes available, that would not be permissible. Thanks, Cletus. The next question is, I'm American and my wife is Japanese. We just had our first child. We live in Japan and plan on buying a house in the U.S. Eventually, 
we'd like to spend fall and winter in America and spring and summer in Japan. I've heard the process of getting a green card for a spouse is long and difficult. What should we do to get ready for the application? Is it wise to hire a lawyer who specializes in immigration from the beginning? Also, will my daughter have to choose a nationality once she turns 18? So for the first part of the question, I think we have actually answered versions of this already in the chat. The, the amount of time that it takes um, to go through the process that Greg outlined in the slides um, is as noted in the slides and also can be found on the USCIS website. Um, whether or not you want to hire an immigration lawyer is a purely personal decision. Um, the instructions are all there online. It's really up to you whether or not you wanna hire an attorney. The second question about your daughter's citizenship, um, I will only answer from the U.S. perspective. The U.S. neither recognizes nor prohibits dual nationality. So as far as the United States is concerned, your daughter is a U.S. citizen and has a U.S. passport and should travel back and forth to the U.S. on that U.S. passport. We do not uh, care whether your daughter has a Japanese passport as well. Um, for Japanese regulations on that issue, um, you would have to check with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I don't, do we want to add anything to that or is that? Nope, that's great. Great, thanks. My US citizen spouse sponsor has submitted the I-130 to USIS, to the US Citizenship and Immigration Services Agency. He's a military employee. Should we have filed with the embassy? Well, you're, you're so you're spouse, your U.S. citizen spouse certainly may file with USCIS. It is not faster, it is slower, but it will ultimately likely come to the same outcome. But this does bring up an important point, which is that uh, for those service members or others who are eligible to file their petitions here in Japan or anywhere overseas, once that person has filed a petition with USCIS, that then ends our ability to accept that same petition here in Tokyo. So if your spouse has already filed one with USCIS, then we can't take one here anymore, um, which is unfortunate, but it's understandable, right? Because we can't have two different petitions for the same relationship happening at the same time. Um, but that is a choice that has to be made before you file a petition in the first place. Thanks, Greg. This is a question for Cletus. I'm planning to change my passport to my married name and I'm using my legal name in my green card. Can I still re-enter the United States? Um, I'm not, you're, they're changing their passport. I'm, I'm, I'm not clear what's changing. They have a green card in a certain name and they're getting a passport in a different name? It sounds like maybe the person has gotten married since they got a green card. Okay, so when entering the US, I mean, the, the primary document that the officer is going to be concerned with is the, is the green card. Um, and so if there's going to be a discrepancy between the green card and your passport, should the officer ask to see it, um, and that's explained by a marriage certificate, I would encourage you to carry that with you upon entering the US. Subsequent to that entry, you should then file to obtain a new green card with your new legal name. And if I could make a related point about that, um, for those of you who are considering filing particularly on, on behalf of Japanese spouses, um, you should be aware that when we issue immigrant visas, uh, in Japan or anywhere else in the world, or any other visas for that matter, the name on the visa will match the name in the passport. So the situation shouldn't happen where an, a person has one name on their immigrant visa and a different name on the passport. Now we know that, that, that some people would like to be able to do that. So they use their married name in the US and their uh, maiden name in Japan. 
but our rules tell us that we have to put on the visa the same name that's in the passport. So those two must match. And the parenthetical surnames that the Japanese like to put in their passports sometimes are, I'm afraid, not quite good enough. The, the primary name in the passport is the one that the immigrant visa will be issued in. So if you want your immigrant visa issued in your married name, then please get a new Japanese passport uh, with your married name reflected as your, as your name. That's a really good point, Greg. Thank you for bringing that up. Next question. For proof of financial support when applying for a spouse visa, would our current jobs in Japan be okay? Or does the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services look more at savings or an already secured future job in the United States? I may actually let our moderator answer this question. Hey, moderator, would you like to answer this question? <laughs> Staying silent. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I, so I can't we, offer a response no, that, to that, Greg, either. That, um, that's fine. What, what we'll look at at the time of your immigrant visa interview, uh, so we're looking at the financial information of the petitioner, the U.S. citizen petitioner, and then... And we're going to look primarily at that petitioner's uh, U.S. tax records. Now, U.S. law means that U.S. citizens have to file their taxes. Uh, even when they live overseas, you may not have to pay taxes, but you have to file taxes. And so uh, we will look at that 1040, uh, or sorry, the, yeah, your 1040 tax return uh, from the, the IRS. And that's basically the income that we're going to look at. If there's a reason to think that your income will disappear when you move back to the United States with your immigrant spouse, we may take that into consideration. That's not usually the case, uh, for most people going from Japan to the U S. So, um, anything really beyond that is, it gets into individual question territory. Thanks, Greg. Next question. This is for Cletus. For Customs and Border Protection, can you please describe your work in Japan? Also, why can't you do that work from Hawaii or Guam? Um, <laughs> I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, um, I appreciate the question. I'm not sure it's really germane to the purpose of this call, uh, but happy to have that discussion with anyone on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, in a different environment. Thanks, Cletus. Uh, next question. Greg, do you accept third country nationals for immigrant visa processing? For example, nurses from the Philippines. Uh, we will accept immigrant visa applications from anyone who lives in Japan. Um, so if you are a Filipino nurse who is living and working in Japan, then yes, certainly we will accept your immigrant visa application here. Um, the expectation, though, when you begin the immigrant visa process is that you will be able to finish the immigrant visa process wherever you are. So if you are living and working and residing in the Philippines, uh, we generally would not take your immigrant visa application here in Japan. Um, that's a little bit different when we talk about tourist visas. For tourist visas, you simply have to be physically present in the place where you're applying at the time that you apply. Um, so, so that would be possible. But for immigrants, we, we generally have a quite strong preference. Uh, I might even say a requirement that you apply for that immigrant visa in the place where you reside. Thanks, Greg. The next question is, for the immigrant visa interview, could you explain how to show U.S. domicile if your U.S. citizen spouse has been living, living overseas, for example, for 30 years, or just living overseas on occasion? Um, so the, I think what this question tries to get at is that um, in order to issue an immigrant visa, we have to know that the petitioner, the U.S. citizen, has a U.S. domicile or intends to establish a U.S. domicile. So the second part of that might be really important for this uh, particular question. 
if the U.S. citizen petitioner has already been living in the U.S., then you probably have uh, tax records, driver's license, I don't know, a library card, whatever else you have that shows that you live in the United States. Um, if you have been living overseas for 30 years or for three years, um, and you and your spouse are now planning to move back to the United States, um, generally speaking, um, we'll be happy to start with a letter from you, the petitioner, saying that I intend to move back to this place and to take up this job, or perhaps I'm retired and there's no job to take up. Um, and and we, we will often accept that at face value. There are cases where we may ask for additional uh, information about your domicile. My colleagues are putting up the frequently asked questions about the form I-864, that's the affidavit of support um, that shows financial uh, ability of the petitioner to support the beneficiary when the beneficiary goes to the United States. And that includes some questions about, uh, about domicile. And so you may want to look at that page as well uh, on travel.state.gov uh, for more detailed information. Thanks, Greg. Next question. I'm a US citizen and my husband is an Australian citizen. Is the green card process and timing the same or faster for another native English speaker? Uh, exactly the same. In fact, we don't know until the interview what language the applicant speaks. I guess there are countries that give immigration points based on English language ability. Maybe Australia is one of those. The United States is not. We don't take uh, language ability into account when we're looking at your, your immigration application. Thanks, Greg. What is the difference or advantage between when comparing a B-1, B-2 tourist visa and the visa waiver program? Well, from the perspective of the embassy, let me talk about some of the reasons that we see B-1, B-2 visa applications from Japanese citizens, and maybe that will answer your question. So one reason, um, let's see, the most some of the most common reasons are that, let's say the Japanese citizen has been arrested at some point and therefore he or she is no longer eligible for the visa waiver program. Um, perhaps the Japanese citizen has traveled to Iran. Um, we see that with some regularity and that also renders them ineligible for the visa waiver program. Um, perhaps that person wants to stay in the United States for more than 90 days. Uh, you can't do that on the visa waiver program. As, as Cletus said, you can't extend your stay on the visa waiver program. But if you're retired and want to go stay at your you know, adult son or daughter's house in the US for four months, you can do that on a tourist visa. Um, you can't do it on the visa waiver program. So that may be another reason uh, that you'd want a visa rather than visa waiver. Um, but generally speaking, you can undertake the same activities in the U.S. on a visa and on the visa waiver program. Thanks much. Next question. Here's a question about petitioners. Can a third person be a guarantor or a financial sponsor if the petitioner does not have significant financial assets? Uh, in fact, a third person must be the guarantor if the petitioner does not have uh, significant either assets or income. Uh, there are guidelines that you can find online for the, the minimum amount of income that the petitioner needs to have in order to sponsor uh, a certain number of immigrants to the U.S. And that number is different depending on how many people are going. For example, if you and your, if you're sponsoring a spouse, there's one level if you're sponsoring a spouse and that spouse's two children, uh, the level's a little bit higher because we're talking about more people. Um, so in those cases where your income or perhaps your assets are not sufficient to meet that level, uh, then yes, we would require there to be a guarantor, we call it a joint sponsor, um, whose uh, generally income can be used to sponsor that uh, immigrant or those immigrants. Thanks, Greg. I have a question about visitor visas, not ESTA. 
Can Japanese spouses use one six month visitor visa to visit the US for two months and then later for four months? Or does the spouse need a new visa each time? For Japanese B visa, visitor visa applicants, uh, our standard is to issue multiple entry visas that are valid for 10 years. There are reasons sometimes that we issue something shorter than that, but that's the standard. Um, and so you can use that visa as many times as you want over the period of its validity. Um, each time you go to the US, you will need to establish to the Customs and Border Protection Officer at the port of entry that you have plans to leave the United States and that you're in fact not residing in the United States. Um, but no, there's no need for a new visa each time. Thanks. My wife was born in the US, but she returned to Japan when she was a child. I'm a Japanese national and going to work in the US. Should my wife apply for a J2 visa? Or should I apply for a spouse visa for her? Well, what, what you do is ultimately up to you, but I will say that your wife can't apply for a J-2 visa because she's a US citizen. Uh, if she was born in the United States, um, that almost always means that that person is a United States citizen and would need to travel to the United States, as Karen mentioned, on a US passport. Um, now that doesn't, preclude you from getting a J-1 visa and going to the U.S. on that J-1 visa while your spouse lives with you on her U.S. passport. That's fine. Um, and that would be most appropriate if you intend to return to Japan at the end of your program. If you plan to go and stay in the U.S., then it may be more appropriate for your spouse to file an immigration petition for you so that you can go to the U.S. on a green card. But keep in mind, that if you do that, it does take something like 12 to 18 months to obtain that immigrant visa and get to the US. So your timeline may, may not allow it. Thanks, Greg. Can my personal physician perform the medical examination? Mm, interesting question. No, they cannot. Um, we have four locations here in Japan where medical exams for Immigrants can be performed. We have two of those locations are here in Tokyo. One is in Osaka and one is in Naha. And those are uh, physician's offices that we work with and in, in many cases we've worked with for years who are very familiar with the CDC's instructions for how to perform those medical exams for immigration, uh, US immigration purposes. Um, and so there are only specific um, doctors that you can see whose exams will be valid for immigration. I'm traveling to the United States with my Japanese spouse and our baby soon. The US passport for our baby is not ready. So can the baby travel on ESTA with a Japanese passport? Uh, I will say this is getting into the realm of, of citizenship questions. Um, the, the short answer there is no, we would not want the baby to travel on a Japanese passport if the baby is a US citizen. Um, passport processing is actually very, very quick right now uh, in our, all of, of our posts in Japan. So um, with a couple of weeks uh, planning time ahead of time, this should not be an issue. Again, please consult our website and make an appointment right away um, if you haven't yet applied for the US passport. Next question is, I haven't been in trouble with the law. Do I still need a police certificate? Yeah. Yes, you do. That's a good question, um, but yes, you do. Um, and there are certain circumstances uh, based on your nationality and where you've lived that will indicate uh, where you need a police certificate from. Um, and for example, if, you've, if you're Japanese and you've always lived in Japan, then just the Japanese police certificate will suffice. If you have some other nationality, you may need one from that country. If you've previously lived in a third country, then you may need one from that other third country. Um, we wish we could take everyone's word for it that they had never been arrested. Unfortunately, 
uh, we, we, we can't. So yes, we do need police certificates from whichever countries um, you meet those, those criteria for. Thanks, Greg. So conversely, the question is, I've been arrested in the past. Can I travel visa free through ESTA? Cletus, do you want to take that one? Yeah, the answer to that's going to be no, most likely. When you're responding to the ESTA questions, um, you will have to indicate that you have been arrested and that will most likely trigger a denial of your, valid, of, of your ESTA approval and will require you to seek a visa to enter the United States. The Thanks, next, Cletus. Next question is, I have a question concerning my grandchildren obtaining U.S. citizenship. My son is a U.S. citizen living here in Japan and hasn't lived in the U.S. His wife is Japanese. They have young children with them here in Japan and would like to obtain U.S. citizenship. Okay, so as we said, this, this is really not a chat about citizenship, but again, I would strongly urge people to consult uh, the embassy website um, and look at the section on citizenship and transmission of citizenship to children born abroad. I think we maybe have time this for is, one or two more questions. Go ahead, Cletus. Well, Karen, I, would just, uh, yeah, I was just going to say, you can also go to the USCIS website and pull up the ins. 600 application uh, and the eligibility criteria is also listed directly on the application for your review. Great, thanks Cletus. Maybe one more question? I think we have time for two more. Okay, two more questions. So I applied for a green card, but I still haven't received it. What should I do, Cletus? Well, I think the, the first question is, when you say you, when they say they applied for a green card, I'm not exactly sure what that means. If they submitted an application for a replacement, or if they're waiting for their initial green card um, uh, from their entry as an as an, as an immigrant. Um, so, without knowing the details, it's really sort of hard to tell them how to follow up. But that would be a question they would submit directly to USCIS, and they do create avenues for the submission of questions through their website. I'm just going to ask a follow up on that, Cletus, because it, it has come up before. When an immigrant enters the U.S. And, and gets the stamp in their passport, typically how long will it take for USCIS to get that physical green card out in the mail to them? Uh, you know, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I'm not exactly sure. I know it does take quite a while, which is the reason we typically give them uh, one year uh, with that temporary stamp. If they're finding that they have not received the card uh, and that one year is approaching, they should contact their local USCIS field office and go in and get a, an additional stamp that extends that further. Great, thank you very much. Are we on our last question? Yes, so this will be the last question for today. Will a recording be available of this town hall? I wasn't able to attend and I would like to hear what is discussed. Absolutely. Um, we intend to put up a recording of this town hall on our social media. Um, so please look for it. And we've covered a lot of ground here today. So please feel free to go back through and look at all the, um, the slides and also um, the questions and answers that we've had. I think um, you will find that the, that the slides, if you, you know, it was a lot of material quickly, but if you look at the slides um, on your own time, I think you'll find them very, very useful. Um, of course, if you have additional questions, please contact us uh, using the information that we have shared today and the contact information. Um, and I, before we go, I just really want to encourage all of you to follow us on social media, not only for immigration and visa information, but for travel information, safety information, voting from overseas information, and all kinds of other uh, information that is very, very useful for U.S. citizens in Japan. We really do try to communicate with you um, as quickly as, as possible any changes that would affect you as Americans here in Japan. 
I really want to thank everyone for joining us here today. Um, we've had a very good uh, turnout and a lot of interesting questions. Um, I also really want to thank my whole team here at the embassy and our DHS attache, Cletus Hunt, for taking the time to do this. It is a lot of work to put something like this together, and I really appreciate all the collaboration that's gone into it. Um, and, and for those of you who joined us today, we would really like to hear from you um, whether you found this to be a useful event. Um, we do have a survey, um, which you can access by clicking the Q&A icon um, at the bottom of your screen. So please take a minute, fill out the survey, let us know what you thought. Um, and of course, we look forward to continuing to serve you and your family members here in Japan at the embassy and at all of our consulates. Um, so thank you very, very much. Uh, and we hope to see you soon.